his voice could, was just getting worse and worse. <clears throat> Not going to be long. But we appreciate Paul and leading singing for us. He does a great job. <clears throat> we are fortunate to have him do so. <clears throat> the Bible depicts many types of followers or kinds of followers of Christ. We've noticed some in past lessons, but realizing that Jesus is to be that example, that we are to follow in His steps, walk in His ways, 1 John 2 and verse 6, we certainly need to be the type of follower that He wants us to be. And in the previous lessons, we've looked at some that, from a negative standpoint, that we should not be. Uh, we saw that Peter followed Jesus afar so off, for example. There were those in John the 6th chapter who sought Jesus or followed Him simply so that they could get fed for the money or the food that they were going to be receiving or that they had received. There's those like Diotrephes in 3 John 9 who simply want the preeminence. They want the glory and thus the glory seekers. We noted those uh, like in John the 12th chapter uh, who are simply critical of others like Judas Iscariot was um, in relationship to Mary's uh, anointing the feet of Jesus. There's those that are simply fussy uh, the Euodius and Synthache in the Philippians 4 would be an illustration of two women there who had some type of problem. And so Paul had to tell them, you be of the same mind in the Lord. There's those who are fearful. Uh, we see that in Mark the fourth chapter uh, with the apostles in the ship as the waves uh, beat on the ship and Jesus asleep in uh, the ship, they come and wake him up because they are fearful and he calms the seas and the winds and asks them, why are you so fearful? Uh, have you no faith or little faith? And so the fearful are another group. Those are that class that would be called negative. We are not to be those type of followers of Jesus. However, there are some that we are to be. And we want to look at those tonight, or two area categories of those tonight. The first of those would be the sacrificial. Good illustration of that group of people would be found in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. In the first five verses, we have the Macedonians. And he's writing to the Corinthians and he tells them, Moreover, brethren, we do you to, to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For, I, for to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and us by the will of God. Here is an illustration of this church, the churches of Macedonia. And specifically here the that which he's talking about is the area of giving, the contribution. And he says here they were in deep poverty themselves. But yet, even in that deep poverty, their joy abounded unto the riches of their liberality. They not only gave to their power or their ability, but Paul says, I bear record, they went beyond the ability that they had to give. They gave more than what they had the ability to. 
And so Paul was certainly commending them in the sacrificial nature of their giving. The key, though, to that sacrificial giving is found in verse 5 when he says, and this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and thus by the will of God. We as Christians are to give ourselves over to God. That's to be our attitude. That's what we're doing when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are dying to that old man of sin. We're dying to self. And that's why Paul would say in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave Himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ. I've died. That's in the act of baptism. You see, we're baptized into Christ's death. We're buried with Him by baptism into death. And then like as Christ was raised from the dead, we also should walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. That's a giving of ourselves over to Him. Dying to self, living unto Christ. That's what these Macedonians had actually done, though. They gave themselves unto God. Then any sacrifice that they made, whether it be financial or any other type, it was already a foregone conclusion. It wasn't a decision that had to be made. They had first given themselves over to God, thus they were willing of themselves to give. Even beyond their ability to give, they gave. And entreated Paul, take the gift. Take the money that we have given for the poor saints in Jerusalem, in Judea. The famine that they were going through, and the difficult times us. So, you take the money to them. Yet, how unusual is that for the church of our Lord today? The Christian life is to be one of sacrifice, though. Romans 12, chapter verse 1 and verse 2. Paul tells them, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Present your life, your body, as a living sacrifice. Now, if you really study the words that are used here in the original language and the tenses of those words, the idea of presenting your body is a completed act. That completed act that took place at baptism. Romans 6 chapter. You have presented your body as a living sacrifice unto God. Now then, the result of that is you live a holy life, an acceptable unto God life. That's your reasonable lifestyle. Your reasonable service. Why? Because we've offered ourselves unto God. We've turned ourselves over to Him. The remaining part of Romans 6 chapter, we center so many times upon verses 3 and 4 that we many times omit the rest of the chapter. You know, we don't get the great teaching that is there. And he's saying, yes, you turn yourself over to God, you in that act of baptism, now then, you be living the Christian life. You yield your bodies as, men, as instruments unto God. Don't yield yourself unto sin. Don't allow sin to control your life. You turn yourself over to God, do so. Live that way. That's what he's repeating here in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. You presented your body this living sacrifice. Now that you live to Him, your life now is to be a life of service to God. But as we look at service for just a second, there are those who serve when compelled. That is, if you ask them to do something, some of them, well, they might do it. 
even though they say sometimes, yeah, I'll do that. It might get done, and you know also that it might not get done, so you have to continue to check on it, whether it is done or not. That's not good. It's good that they will serve, but if we're not ever sure if they'll ever do the service, it really becomes a problem, doesn't it? Then there's those who you ask them to do something, and yes, I'll do that, and you can make sure and you have confidence because they said they're going to do it, they're going to do it. It's going to get done. Well, that is a whole lot better. But what's best yet is someone who sees something that needs to be done and they do it. You don't have to ask them. You don't have to compel them into service. It is an attitude, I'm here to serve, and they're looking for that area of service. That's the type of individuals that we really need in the church. Not just someone who has to be compelled into service. Whether they will accept that service or not, yet need those individuals who are self-starters, as many times we would put it in our society today. That they're there, they're self-starting. They see something, they act upon it. Someone needs to be taught, they're there teaching them. Don't have to go up to them and say, would you go teach so-and-so? Some work needs to be done, they're there working on it, doing the action. <clears throat> Instead of having to go up to them and say, would you please go do this? And some of them you can never even depend, even if you ask them, they're not going to do it anyway. They're not going to serve any at all. They just want to enjoy the blessings of Christianity without putting forth any effort of Christianity. <clears throat> Paul is emphasizing, you be a servant. Here is your reasonable service. You've turned your life over to God. Now then live for Him. Act in His way. Serve Him acceptably. In Hebrews the 13th chapter, verses 15 and 16, Paul talks about by Him, by Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to, God, to Him, or, or to uh, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Here is individuals who are sacrificing, a sacrificial individual, in giving thanks to God through the fruit of their lips. And certainly that's going to include our singing, but certainly it's not limited to that. Prayers that we offer would certainly be along that line. Teaching others would be the fruit of our lips. Using our tongues, our language, our ability to speak, to teach others, to do His will, to do His bidding, to give praise and adoration to God. But then, he says to do good. This is very simply acting in a way that would be acceptable to others and would benefit them. To aid other individuals, to give them comfort and help when they have need. Just uh, look at the life of Jesus as we went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, Peter says in Acts, the 10th chapter, and verse 38. You follow his steps. Be sacrificial in your in your life. And even as Christ came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, you go about ministering to others, doing good unto others. And then he says, to communicate, forget not. Now that word communicate is a word which means fellowship. You have fellowship with those who do such. You give aid and support. To those who are doing these things. Those individuals who are living for God, you encourage them. You build them up 
in whatever way, various ways that can be done. Sacrifice. With these type of sacrifices, God is well pleased. Peter would put it in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, that ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he would add, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises or the excellencies of Him that hath called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Here is the spiritual sacrifices. What are those spiritual sacrifices? It's living for Him. It's doing those things that God wants us to do, both in relationship to God and in our relationship with others. That doing right and being righteous has that twofold application in being right with God, but also in being right with others. Doing what God wants us to do, but also doing what others are need, need help and aid and comfort in. And so we're there sacrificing of ourselves, whether it be sacrificing our, our time, sacrificing our abilities, sacrificing our money, even as these Macedonians have done. Giving of ourselves. Some individuals are willing to give their money, but they're not willing to give themselves. As if the money by itself will make it all right. Well, money is necessary, yes. need to be sacrificing in that area. But that alone is not sufficient. Others, well, they'll sacrifice some of their time, but don't expect any money from them. Well, that's not sufficient either. It takes all of it working together. A sacrificial individual, why? Because we first give ourselves unto God. And when we give ourselves unto God, then all of these other things will take care of itself. The problem so many times is people have not given themselves to God. You know, that's really the problem when you look at so many of the problems in the church today. That's the real basis of it. They've not, we've got individuals who have never truly given themselves unto God. They want to enjoy the benefits of Christianity. They want to go to heaven, but not enough to really become sacrificial within their life. They want to enjoy the benefits of Christianity, but they don't want to make the sacrifices that are necessary to enjoy those benefits. Sacrificial followers of Christ. But then last, we would notice that there's the faithful unto death people. Paul is a great illustration of this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 through verse 8. Paul says, I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Paul says, I'm at the end of my life. When he writes this, in all probability, this is the last letter that he wrote while here upon this earth. He's about to go before Caesar Nero. But he's going before Nero on this occasion as an enemy of the state. He has been arrested. He didn't appeal to Caesar this time, but he has been arrested by the Roman government. And now then he is standing before Caesar. Nero is an enemy because of his Christianity. And so he says, I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand, it's near. I'm fixing to be put to death by Nero. Quite a difference from his first imprisonment in Rome that we read about in the latter part of the book of Acts. And we read those prison epistles, read Philippians especially, the first chapter, 
where he says he's expecting to be released from prison on that occasion. Now then he says, I don't expect to be released. I expect to die. But in looking at my life, I finish my I've fought the good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Someone who is faithful unto death. He had entered that fight. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18, he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Paul had entered that warfare, but he didn't enter the warfare simply to get a draw or to lose that fight. It seems as if some Christians enter into a warfare and they enter not to win. They really don't want to lose, but they don't want to win either. Paul is saying, I entered that fight to war a good warfare. I'm entering this fight to win it. To do everything within my power to live the type of lifestyle that God wants me to live. To fight that fight against Satan and the forces of Satan. And to defeat them utterly. To destroy them. I'm sure if you could ask Paul, are you trying to destroy Satan and the forces of Satan from off the earth? Absolutely. I would like to, if I could, to absolutely destroy them from the earth. He wanted to win the battle. In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, starting in verse 10, we have the, a section dealing with the warfare and the armor that the Christian is to put on. And he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We're in a battle, he's saying. And yes, you need to take this armor of God and you need to put it on. And I think it's interesting if you look at all of the armor that he sets forth. Every one of the pieces of armor that he sets forth has direct reference to God's Word. Look at, at it. We are to have our loins girt about with truth. Paul said, or Christ said, Thy word is truth. How are your loins girt about with truth? Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Where is the righteousness of God revealed if it's not in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Romans 1, 16 and 17. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Here is the gospel. God's word that brings peace. Yes. Peace with God because people will obey that gospel and shun that old way of, of sin. They will obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and thus be at peace with God. And it brings peace with self. And as much as life in you live peaceably with all men. So it's the gospel of peace. Taking the shield of faith. Well, the faith is God's word. 
that has been once for all delivered unto us. Jude verse 3. And through that shield of faith we're able to quench those fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation. Well, salvation again goes back to God's Word. That which reveals that salvation to us. Christ is our Savior. He's told us, He's instructed us what we must do in order to be saved. We find that revealed to us again within God's Word. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So as you look at all of these elements of the Christian's armor, all of them tied directly in with the Word of God. And now then Paul says, we're in a fight, we're in a battle. And you take this so you can stand against the laws of the devil. You know, as a, as a warrior, and this is describing the armor of that day that the Roman soldier would wear. And that Roman soldier, as he entered into a battle, <clears throat> He didn't enter into it just to stand there and take the, the attack of the enemy. He put on that armor to enter into the battle and to win the battle, to go into that battle and fight against that enemy. So it is with the Christian. He takes that armor and places it upon himself and he enters into the battle, but he goes into that battle to destroy the enemy, to defeat the enemy of Satan. We don't just stand back and take the, the arrows and the attacks of Satan, but we go forward advancing the cause of Christ. And what do we do so many times? Well, you know, we've got the church building there. You all go to the church building and you can hear about God and about Christ and you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's about it. We don't take the gospel into the world. Remember Jesus said, go. Some would say, as far as the way in which we live nowadays, we all just come. The opposite of what Christ said, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There is an aspect that we are advancing the cause of Christ. We're in this battle to fight the fight. Yes, but in advancing the cause of Christ, not just taking the blows of Satan. Yes, he's going to attack us. He's going to bring about those blows. And we have God's Word to defeat them. But we need to be going as well. We need to be advancing in that cause of Christ. Again, look at Paul. In 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, he uses the illustration of a race. Verse, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 26. When he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Here is a race, and the aspect that he's using is the Olympic Games. And here is this runner who, he says, has been temperate in all things. He's practiced self-control in every aspect of his life. Why? So that when he gets to that Olympic game, he can win the race. He can run effectively so that he can win the prize. Now they do it, he says, to obtain a corruptible crown. We enter into a race to obtain an incorruptible one, that eternal life with God in heaven. But what do we have to do? We have to run the race. A lot of us are willing just to sit on the sideline and cheer on others. Instead of getting out into the fro and running the race themselves. In Hebrews 12th chapter, Paul again uses this same type of illustration. 
when he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, who instead of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty or the throne of, of God. You've entered a race. Now then, you have that endurance to continue to the end. And again, that's what Paul did within his life. He entered into that battle, but he entered into that battle with the aspect, I'm going to endure to the end. I'm going to keep on to the end of my life. And that's what he did. And so he fought. He battled. He battled the forces of Satan. The temptations that Satan would throw in his way. He battled the false doctrine. But he also was there advancing the cause of Christ. There's that twofold aspect. Battling, yes, in defeating false doctrine and false teachers of every stripe, every kind, and yet being evangelistic and taking the gospel to a lost and dying world. He did both. And he continued, he says, to that in that fight until the time of his departure. He embraced the faith to keep it. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, he would tell Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life whereunto thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You fight that good fight of the faith. And yet, so many Christians today don't want to fight. They just want to sit back and do nothing. They don't want to enter that race. But perseverance is the key to that eternal salvation. Entering the fight, entering the race, but persevering to the end. Jesus told His apostles and those disciples that He was sending out on the limited commission in Matthew the 10th chapter. That ye shall be hated of all men for My name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And while he was telling this to those disciples, it's a good principle in relationship to us as well. That we're not above our Master, and as they hated Him, they're going to hate us. And thus last Sunday morning we were looking at that aspect of suffering. And how that because the world loves darkness and hates the light, they're those who are walking in the light and exposing darkness, they're going to hate. They're going to persecute. They're going to bring afflictions upon us. And so you'll be hated of all men for My name's sake. What's the key? You endure. You continue on. The tendency so many times though, is that we start taking those blows of Satan in that spiritual warfare and we start retreating. We start pulling back instead of advancing. While it's been disputed, some have stated that the Roman armor that Paul uses here in Ephesians the sixth chapter that there was only armor for the front side and that there was no armor in the back. Now I say that's been disputed. I'm not sure of the truthfulness of that. But the lesson is very applicable in that they use that to show the Roman army was only to advance. They were never to retreat. They were never to pull back and turn their backs upon the enemy. They were always expecting move forward. Go forward. So many times when we face the battles and the enemy seems strong, 
our tendency is to pull back, to stop the advance. And Paul is, or Christ is saying, you've got to endure, you've got to continue on. You can't stop. Revelation, the second chapter. They're told to fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison that you may be tried. And here is the fight that they're entered into against Satan. And now then, the devil's going to cast some of you in prison. There's going to be this fight. It's a spiritual warfare. And yes, some of you will be cast into prison. That you shall, and you will have tribulation ten days, he says. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Some, Paul some misuse this to be to be saying you be faithful until you die. And that's really not what it's saying here. You be faithful even if it causes you death. But either way, it shows the endurance to the end. Even if being faithful and entering you've entered into this battle and there's a spiritual warfare and that spiritual warfare causes you to be put to death, you be faithful. You endure, even if it causes you to end up being dead. You endure. That's the type of follower that God expects of us. That's the type of follower that Paul was. As we read there, I have finished my course. I've kept the faith in fighting that good fight of faith. What's the result? There's a crown of righteousness laid up for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me. But not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. When we have a true love for God, then we're going to enter into that fight. We're going to advance the cause of Christ. And we're going to continue to do so until the end. What type of follower are we though? Are we the type of follower that God expects of us? Are we that sacrificial follower? Are we that type of follower that endures to the end, that's faithful to the end? Or are you the type of follower that maybe follows afar off? Or some other way? The only way in which we can be acceptable unto God and hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, is to be a sacrificial follower that endures to the end. If you become a follower of Christ but have not truly followed Him, and you've allowed sin to come within your life and you're no longer in that battle against Satan, but you may be succumbed to the temptations that he has thrown in your way. And you realize this evening you need to come back and you need to enter into that battle once again and be an active participant in that battle. And we would plead with you to respond to this invitation this evening. The Lord's invitation to come unto Him and have that rest. But we have to put forth the effort that is necessary. If you've never entered into that fight, you've never become a Christian, then why not this evening obey the gospel of Jesus Christ through your faith, repentance, and making the confession of your faith and then letting us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need to come, then do so as we stand and sing the invitation song and we bid you come.